Mm. Hej och välkomna tillbaka. Ni har fått en enkät på era stolar som ni jättegärna får fylla i och lämna vid dörren när ni går. Så att vi vet vad vi kan göra bättre till nästa år. Tack så mycket. Uh, the last presenter of the day is Robert Douglas. <laughs> Robert, ha Robert has been a part of the Drupal project almost since the start. And uh, with, with deep technical knowledge and great business experience, he knows everything about the Drupal project. Hmm. And now you're here to talk about Drupal 8. Yes, I am. Thank Welcome. you. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, first, a public service announcement. After the session, the conference is over, more or less, but we're going to actually keep talking about Drupal in that we're going to go out the door, across the hall, into another room over there, and there we're going to keep talking about Drupal. So if you're welcome to join us, there will be other people coming in from um, Stockholm meetups to join in the conversation. And there I will be presenting uh, on the topic of platform.sh, which is the company that I work for, and it's the platform as a service hosting product that can take any PHP application, any web application, including Drupal, and make a full development workflow and production hosting workflow. And if you'd like to see that or just mingle with uh, more Drupal people, just across the hall right after the session. So next I want to uh, thank the um, organizers of this conference and especially the Drupal track for inviting me to come. First of all, uh, I like jam. Uh, like I like jam and I like, as jam does, I like traveling to Stockholm <laughs> to talk about Drupal. <laughs> And um, they gave me the task about talking about Drupal 8. And it was this is actually the first time I've talked about Drupal 8 in front of an audience. And as a result of having to talk about Drupal 8 for the first time for you, I had to go and actually do all my research and make sure I knew everything there was to know about Drupal 8. And as a result, I'm way more excited about Drupal 8 than I was. So thank you. So <laughs> All right, a little bit of background. So we're all here today principally because Drupal 7 and the other versions of Drupal before that were an enormous success. Okay, Drupal 7 uh, runs 2.1% of all of the websites on the internet. I mean, you can find slightly different variations of that number depending on who's doing the measuring, but that is a heck of a lot of websites by sheer number. It becomes more impressive when you look at what those websites are and you realize that many of them are critical websites for governments, universities, large corporations, NGOs, uh, communities like Drupal itself, and that they serve very critical purposes in building the fabric of the internet as we know it. So from that point of view, Drupal 7's been an amazing success. Uh, Drupal Dot org itself, the home base of Drupal development and community activities, has uh, 1.167 million registered users. That's a large community by anybody's measure. And of those people, 37,000 of them are developer accounts, meaning they have the permission to write code and push the code to Drupal. That's an enormous amount of developers. Imagine what you could do at your organization if you had 37,000 developers, right? You wouldn't even know where to begin. What could they do? That's amazing how many people are able to work on Drupal. It's a worldwide movement. Um, at DrupalCon in Austin in 2014, that's the last number I could find, there have been a couple since then, um, there were 3,700 people in attendance. It's this vast sea of people doing Drupal, so even when we get together in one location, um, there are a lot of people involved. And if you want to look at some of the sites that people have built with Drupal on your own, please do look at drupal.org slash case minus studies, case studies, because then you can see the different types of sites that people have built with Drupal, what their challenges were, maybe they meet your own challenges, maybe uh, you can see what recipes they used for success on drupal.org, and that all goes under the category of, wow, wasn't Drupal 7 great, okay? But the big question today is, what about Drupal 8? We've just released it this month on November 19th, we came to the first released version. Will it live up 
to the success of Drupal 7, or has that ship sailed? And is it actually two years too late for Drupal 8? A question which I think a lot of people have asked in the last two years as the release date was pushed out further and further and further. Would you really want to start a new project on Drupal 8 now, or is it yesterday's technology? Okay, hopefully my presentation will help answer some of those questions for you and also make you more familiar with the capabilities of Drupal 8 so that you can decide whether or not you want to use it. Now, don't just take my word for it. If you want to have something that's nice to print out and read and hand to your stakeholders, your colleagues, your boss, your customers, I highly recommend the uh, PDF white paper that Acquia has prepared. Uh, Angela Byron, web chick herself, prepared this document. It's many pages long. It's beautifully presented. It has at least as much material in it as what I'm presenting to you today. And if you um, just uh, Google for the ultimate guide to Drupal 8, uh, then you'll certainly find it. Or you can, as I see some of you doing, take a picture of the screen uh, or memorize the URL or just type it in right now. <laughs> and you'll get this great PDF. And if, if you don't find it, you can write to me afterwards and I'll mail it to you, okay? So now I'm gonna start going through a huge list of features about Drupal 8, about what's new in Drupal 8, and what you can do with Drupal 8. All of it builds on Drupal 7, so everything that you know you can do with Drupal 7, you can also do in Drupal 8. I'm going to focus on the new parts, and I'm going to try to explain them in the point of view of what the business value is and how the problem is solved. So let's start with language support. This should be really clear to everybody in the room. Drupal 7 uh, was took a lot of work to internationalize uh, and put into a different language, but as soon as you install Drupal 8, from the very first moment, the very first screen, you can see that enormous effort has been put in to translating and localizing Drupal 8. And it goes far beyond just installing the software in a language of your choice. Um, there's also uh, a number of features and tasks involved in doing a multi-language site, which required many modules in Drupal 7, and uh, they were not always organized in the way that they worked together, and they were maintained by different people. They're all now in Drupal core. So this is um, uh, a very grainy uh, screencast from uh, Gabor Hoichi, who's the um, initiative leader uh, for localization translation in Drupal. Uh, he's also an Acquia um, person, uh, works with Jam, works with Dries. And he's showing in Drupal 7 all of the things that you had to put together to do a multilingual site, okay? You had to get some content translation, but that's different than entity translation because entities came later in Drupal, so we had to figure out a different way to translate those. And you had all those things. Now, in Drupal 8, they're all brought into core, so you get that when you download the main core distribution. You don't have to ask yourself what modules to use. It's all in there, and it's uh, basically uh, into four categories of things. Everything in Drupal 8 is an entity, so the content translation is there, but they also think about how to translate things like the variables and the, the metadata that Drupal stores, so that, for example, your site name can be different, or what the front pages can be different based on what language you're visiting. There are all sorts of things that they've thought of, that's all inside of Drupal 8. So if you have the need for a multilingual website, or if you simply need to translate it and localize it for Swedish market or any other market, it's a dream compared to Drupal 7. There's so much business value added to Drupal 8. So that's one of the big selling points. So another big selling point for Drupal 8 is mobile first. How many people actually look at the web on a big computer versus on this? Now, on any given day, it depends on how much I'm out of the house, but I'm guaranteed to look at the web many times on this device, and um, depending on whether I'm at my desk working or not, then I, of course, surf the web on my MacBook or my computer, but actually the business critical, in the moment, I need it now type of surfing, now all happens on my phone. And that's something that really has evolved in the last five or six years for most of the people I know, uh, that the phones have these capabilities, that they're always connected to the internet. And Drupal 7 made no special provision for that. It wasn't responsive out of the box, and it didn't have great capabilities for uh, um, 
uh, web services, so you couldn't easily build native mobile apps with it, but Drupal 8 fixes all that. So it fixes it in several ways. First of all, it adopted Dru H HTML5 out of the box, and HTML5 is one way that you can use to one technology you can use to make mobile applications. Okay, there, if you're familiar with mobile apps that you can have on your phone, there are basically two philosophies, two approaches. You can have a website that's made in HTML5, and that's your mobile application, or you can make a, mo a native mobile application that you have to code and compile for every platform, mostly these days, either Android or iPhone, iOS. So Drupal 8 has HTML5 out of the box, and that has a lot of advantages. The advantages including the mobile optimization, like I just said, but it's also got built-in media, so like uh, audio and video playback, uh, can do offline caching, so you can have uh, some of your data uh, on your phone or on your computer even when you're not online, very important for phones. Um, it's got cleaner code, and Drupal does it out of the box. Drupal 8, also implemented responsive design out of the box. That means that uh, as your website changes its viewport, as it's either wider or iPad-sized or iPhone-sized, it can be presented differently so that it's optimal for whatever device it's on, and it knows how to do that without you doing anything. Now, of course, you can customize that. You can tailor it to your needs, but Drupal 8 takes care of the basics, the fundamentals, right out of the box. From the moment you install it, you have a responsive website. That also means that the editing experience for content editors and administrators for Drupal 8 is possible on devices like this. Whereas if you ever tried to really edit and ma maintain and administer a Drupal 7 site on your phone, it was not really a user-friendly experience in a lot of ways, even if you had worked on a responsive design for the uh, Drupal 7 site. So this is a very big business value for Drupal 8. Also, uh, very much under the idea of mobile, but not necessarily limited to mobile, is the fact that uh, Drupal 8 has made great strides in becoming a web API engine. Okay, uh, here are some of the different modules that you can turn on to enable Drupal 8 as a web API engine. Now, what's a web API? Web API is basically a computer that can offer you a data service of some sort. You could say, um, tell me what the next five concerts are in Stockholm. And you ask, you ask that on the web API, and it gives you back the next five concerts in Stockholm, because that's what the API does. But it does it not as a web page with all the pictures and all the design, but as pure data. You ask it a question, you get pure data back. This is a very useful function for a Drupal website to do. Why? There are two main reasons. One is the native mobile application reason, which I already kind of uh, told you about, but it makes it so that you can write a native application for your phone, but get all the data from your Drupal website. And the Drupal 8 website can be the data driver for the native application. The other reason you would want your website to spit out data like that is if you wanted something that's really voguish and popular and uh, people are doing it a lot these days. And that's called uh, decoupled web applications or headless Drupal is something that you might always uh, also see spoken of. Um, these are several ways that the Pantheon uh, I.O. people have identified s several paradigms for this decoupled architecture. But the idea is that you write uh, a JavaScript or an HTML5 application, and that's the front end, but it gets the data from some sort of data back end, and that's usually Drupal. And for Drupal to be able to do that, it also needs to have these web API services so that the JavaScript front end can ask the back end of data, hey, what are the next uh, five concerts in Stockholm? And it gets the data back answering that question, and then it knows how to display that data or how to interact with that data in the web application. Drupal's perfect for this, Drupal 8 is perfect this, for this because of its uh, care and detail paid towards APIs and uh, data. So, another very important 
business value for Drupal 8 is the fact that it is more accessible. It's more accessible to people with vision impairments or blindness um, in particular um, because of the WAI ARIA markup that it, it gives than it's uh, got semantically correct markup. That means uh, machines understand it better, like the Google search engine or the Bing search engine understand your data better, understand your website better, understand what you're showing. And screen readers that are used by people who are blind or have visual impairments to browse the internet actually work really well with Drupal 8 because of this. So they've got the WAI ARIA markup, but they've also got things like oral alerts. If you've got them turned on, your website will talk to you to let you know what's going on uh, and give you certain signals and you can code the website to give uh, uh, tips and hints about the interaction of what you're doing on the website which a visually impaired person would need that uh, a sighted person might not need but Drupal can do that out of the box because of uh, adherence to these standards um, and there are some other very important details in there around tab ordering, alt text, um, inline form errors that make the experience of using Drupal a good one for people who can't see well or can't see at all. And that happens to be 285 million <laughs> million <laughs> million <laughs> people on earth. So <laughs> so <laughs> all right. Next great feature on Drupal, um, it's for the people you hire to make your Drupal site look good, uh, how you want it to. So that might be you if you're a themer or a designer, or the people that you hire to design or theme your site for you. It's called Twig. It's easy and safe templating. <laughs> I, you know, I was hoping that if I just... I was, I, I was, I, I blame autocorrect, but I was hoping if I just left my presentation on their hard drive all morning, all of these errors would go away. <laughs> Easy and safe, tempting. Yes. Hello. My name is Twig. <laughs> It's important to be able to manipulate the theme layer of your site and make it look good uh, as a non-programmer without breaking the site, either from a pro programmatic point of view or from a security point of view. That was not really possible in Drupal 7. The themers had to have uh, at least a passable minimal knowledge of PHP or they'd screw things up really bad. Really bad meaning either building security problems into your website without you knowing it or just breaking the website so it can't even serve the front page. Those were all possible in Drupal 7, but that's not possible in Drupal 8. You can now throw a designer with no PHP experience, whatever, at a Drupal 8 site with Twig, and not only can they not break anything, but they can reuse template files from other people, and they can use the integration with their favorite development tools, uh, their IDEs, their integrated development environments. They can use those tools that they're familiar with to do their job better. So you're going to lower the cost of theming your site. You're going to increase the security and the speed to which you get your site to look good based on this. And Twig is also something that's um, these are some examples, is, is used by a large number of other projects. So if you've had the problem in the past or if you're worried about having the problem of not finding people who know the technology that you're choosing when you choose Drupal 8, Twig is something that will be familiar to a lot of people in and outside of the PHP world and certainly well beyond the Drupal world. So that's a good thing. So it's really easy. Uh, you know that um, any of these things like the page content there, I shouldn't push buttons without knowing what they are. Um, is there a laser pointer? No. Um, any case, uh, if you've seen PHP, if you've seen Drupal templating in Drupal 7, you see that that's a great improvement. Now, of course, with any website, if you're going to build an important website or a highly trafficked website, you need to know about the scalability and performance qualities of the technology that you're choosing. And Drupal 8 has a lot to offer in this front. But I will start the conversation by saying, if you take a raw PHP measurement of the speed of Drupal 8, it's significantly slower than Drupal 7. 
Should that be worrying you? Because if you go independently research my slides, you'll run into some performance benchmarks that say, hey, we've got a problem here. Drupal 8's slower than Drupal 7. And there's actually some truth to that. And I'm not worried. And I'll tell you why I'm not worried, OK? There are several reasons why I'm not worried and why I think Drupal 8's going to be a dream for people who are interested in scalability and performance. Um, and here are, here's the overview of the reasons. First of all, most of the experience that people have of any website is first and foremost determined by how well can that website cache stuff. And cache, of course, is when, if you've got your website here, and you've got the other person who needs it here, there's somebody in, in, in the middle saying, Okay, uh, what are the next five concerts in Stockholm? What are the next five concerts in Stockholm? I get the answer and I say, okay, here are the next five Stockholm concerts for you. Have a nice day. And then the next person comes, they ask, what are the next five concerts in Stockholm? I don't need to ask the website anymore. I know the answer. I'm cash. I cash that answer and I give it really fast. Boom, 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 boom. Don't even bother him. He's sleeping. And you know, if 100 people come and ask me the same question, I've got it cached. I can give it to him really fast. And this is a general computing problem. It's very important for web technologies. And it's one of the hardest problems to solve. Because you always have to know, if I'm telling the person the next five concerts in Stockholm and one of them just got canceled, or there's another one that's come, or they've changed the roster or the lineup, I need to be able to tell that person. But my goal is to not have to ask them the question again, right? So there's a a problem. If I have to go back to the website to get the data, it ruins the point of caching. Okay, so it's a very complicated topic, believe me. Extraordinarily complicated to the point where you can really make uh, somebody who's editing your website very mad if they go and they edit some content on the front page and they push it up there, a new image, new title, and they hit refresh on their browser and they're like, hey, why is the old web page still there? And you're like, cache. They don't like that answer very much. So there's a lot of nuance around cache, but cache is what makes websites go fast. And Drupal 8 has more precise caching than basically any CMS on Earth. Not just more than Drupal 7, but it's literally the most sophisticated, most well thought out caching CMS that I know of, period, out of any technology anywhere. And it's more precise and more efficient on how it labels its cache, like, hey, this is an image, or this is a blog, or this is an article, or this was written by Jim, that one was written by Jody. It's more precise in labeling all the content in uh, various ways, and it's more precise in the invalidation of the cache. What's the invalidation of the cache? That's when somebody comes and asks me, what are the next five concerts? And my website taps me on the shoulder and says, <coughs> no, 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 new information. There's a new concert that's come up, and that old concert's been canceled, and you need to give them a different answer. That's the invalidation of cache. So Drupal is very good at, Drupal 8 is very good at invalidating just parts of the cache so that you don't have to rebuild the whole thing, which generally comes at great cost to your website and servers. So Drupal 8 is going to perform and scale much better than Drupal 7 because of its ability to cache. But it can't just, it's not just caching on the server side, which is where Drupal's usually uh, worried about performance. It's also the fact that it can do caching on the client side, the client being your phone or your browser that you're looking at the website on. So that you, if you get some data sent to you and if your browser can hold on to that data, it will hold on to that data so that next time you need it, it doesn't have to go across the internet to get it. It'll be really fast. Your experience of it will be fast because it's local in your browser and it doesn't put the load on the server which might make the server slow down. So that will also help your websites in Drupal 8 be faster. Now. The dynamic content substitution, I've got a video about that in just a second that I can hardly wait to show you because it's really awesome and it's got a great name, okay? But the, the, the next reason that I've got on my list doesn't even have anything to do with Drupal at all. And it's why I'm personally completely not worried about how fast Drupal 8 is compared to Drupal 7 because all the while that we've been building Drupal 8, PHP, the underlying language and technology that we use to run these things, has gone, undergone a revolution. Not just an improvement, but an 
all-out revolution. It used to be a nasty, dirty language that you'd never let anybody touch with a barge pole because it was just kind of a yucky, amateurish language. But it's actually gone through a huge professionalization in the way package management is done, and performance-wise, it's brilliant. They've made it twice as fast over the past few years in the newest version coming out, PHP 7, which runs Drupal 8 now. You can use PHP 7 on Drupal 8 now. Uh, I can prove that in my session across the, the, the hall. It's twice as fast. So, okay, Drupal 8's a little slower than Drupal 7 on an old version of PHP. Let's try it on this new PHP that we never had available before, and it's going to be faster than anything we've ever had. So that's a great thing. So just by virtue of PHP getting better, you've got all of these advantages of Drupal 8, and you don't have to worry about performance. Now, this video is content dynamic content substitution. And I'm going to let it run a couple times because it goes by a little fast. I'm going to explain to you what's happening. So basically, the red boxes are showing you dynamic content that has to be personalized for the person who's looking at the website. It can't be the same for everybody because it's got things like their username or the last posts that they've thing or controls that they have uh, based on their user permissions. Now, what traditional is doing is it's building all of the content on the website in one go on the server and it doesn't send anything until it's all done and then it sends the whole thing at once. Okay, and that takes on the on the cold cache cache. Remember cache, very important. On the cold cache, what it took six seconds. To, okay, that's a really long time. It's on somebody's laptop. On the warm cache, after cache had been uh, primed a little bit, then it took three some seconds. Okay, now what Big Pipe does is it says, okay, let's divide this page into little bits. Okay, we're going to send the stuff that never changes on the page up front. And the people are going to get that really fast, okay? That's why you see this side appear first. Boom, 0.25 seconds. The person can start reading. I mean, to your eyes, you barely even recognize that the page isn't fully loaded. But if you watch the, the big pipe side, you'll see that some other parts, the personalized parts, appear a little bit after the fact. Those are the hard parts that you can't cache, that Drupal has to go through the whole process of generating, but because of the way big pipe works, it can send the unchanging things first and the hard to cache uh, dynamic personalized things later and it builds it into the page. You've seen this if you use Facebook or other applications like Gmail uh, because they do, the similar th do a similar thing. They send the things that don't change, they send first, the things that are easy, and then the things that uh, need to appear uh, on Facebook, they either appear later or if their server is overloaded for that one feature, that fe feature just doesn't appear and you probably never even notice. You, only, you don't notice what's missing because you're so distracted by the cat that's right in the front of the page. Okay, so that's big pipe, that's exciting. So here's back to the PHP 7 performance. So this is a comparison of all of the PHP versions. 4.4 uh, is what I was using when I started Drupal. We've been with 5 for a very long time. Um, even the difference between 5.4, which is the, the, the red one 2.18, and uh, 5.6, which is 1.19, that's already a huge performance improvement that will save you thousands and thousands of dollars in hosting if you've got a big site. But where it really gets exciting, and I mean really exciting, is if you looked at the jump from PHP 5.6 to 7.0. Now, different benchmarks vary on the results. The, 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 the yellow one is called Hip Hop VM. That's uh, something that was also piloted and pioneered by Facebook. Drupal can also run on that. Um, but Drupal 7 is the interesting one because it's uh, sorry, PHP 7 is the interesting one because it's standard PHP. It's going to be on all of your Linux boxes, all of your Ubuntu's, all of your Debian's, all of your Red Hats that you get. Um, if you download something like WAMP or MAMP for local development, it will have PHP 7. You don't have to do anything special. With Hip Hop VM, you have to actually install that, so not as many people will have that available. But the fact that Drupal or PHP 7 is so fast means that you're going to get all of these advantages um, basically for free out of the box just by having waited long enough. It's great stuff. 
All right. Next business value for Drupal 8 is that a large part of Drupal 8, and I started to mention part of this with Twig, the templating engine, uh, large portions of Drupal 8 are built by other projects. They're no longer Drupal specific. So Drupal 7 was almost completely, from top to bottom, 100% a Drupal project. The notable exceptions to that were uh, mainly just jQuery, one of the JavaScript libraries. But with Drupal 8, not only did we adopt Symfony and a whole bunch of components from Symfony, there are other things like PHP unit for testing that we've adopted that are all maintained elsewhere. And these things along the bottom are other projects that I listed that use Symfony components as their basis. So PHP BB, that's uh, Laravel, Easy Publish, Joomla, yeah, it still exists. Uh, Magento, Pwik, and there are a lot more projects that use Symfony components. And that's a good thing for everybody involved. That means that the smart people who are maintaining Symfony are simultaneously improving all of these projects, including Drupal, when they do their work. It also means that a developer who has worked on any of these or worked on pure Symfony projects can easily move to any of the other projects and understand the fundamentals of the code. So the problem that Drupal has suffered from for years about not having enough developers or having a, a, a hard time onboarding people onto the project is going to start, away, uh, start to go away. This should be uh, an interesting uh, wake-up call for Drupal specialized agencies because some of their unique selling value is going to dwindle as the next PHP shop down the road who's never done Drupal before will know almost as much about Drupal as they do simply by having learned Symfony. Very interesting, but it's good for Drupal overall. All right, next business value for Drupal 8. Um, just the overall usability and the editing, uh, content editing experience, the administrative experience has improved dramatically over Drupal 7. So I think, yes, I've got a nice entertaining video that um, comes from a series of uh, training videos that um, OS Training and Acquia have made online on YouTube. You can find them there. Um, I think that's where I got this one. Um, I have to put the credit on it still. But what you're seeing right there was the uh, inline what you see is what you get editor. So for years, I mean for 15 years since Drupal started to exist, people were always asking for a nicer way to edit the text than having to just write HTML or Markdown or BB code or anything else that you uh, were being asked to write. And we finally have that in Drupal in the form of inline editing. It means you can go to a field uh, like the title or the um, whatever field you want to edit, and there's a control right on the web page to edit just that field. And you push that, and a box pops up, and you change the value, close it, and it's saved. And you don't have to go through an entire process of opening the edit form making the edit, finding the save button, pushing the save button, closing the whole form. It's just you edit that field in line and close it and it's done. That's the way most modern web applications work today. So this is simply Drupal more or less catching up with best practices. Now, the other thing that I showed in this video was uh, the image styles and core. Uh, image styles uh, are the different ways that you might manipulate the images that you load up, uh, upload. So imagine I send up an image that's this big, okay? I've got a really big camera, so it takes really big pictures. And I need several versions of this. First of all, I need a thumbnail. Maybe it's a picture of me. Then I need a thumbnail for when my user image you know, appears in lists or like at the top of the page, that image actually has to be processed by the website and brought down to a small size. Maybe I need a black and white version. Maybe I need a banner version for across the top of the website. Maybe I need a 600 by 480 version for, um, the, uh, for a blog post. There are all sorts of different image manipulations that modern websites have to do. And in Drupal 7, you had to install extra modules and configure those modules to get those done. Those modules are now in core, and they're tightly integrated with the what you see is what you get editor, so that not only can you control the different derivative images that you need the website to make, you can easily inject them into the content that you're editing, all without getting any extra modules. 
Okay? Next absolute huge triumphant victory for Drupal 8. So for years, it's been the insider Drupal secret that one of the most valuable parts of Drupal was the views module. Now, what's the views module? Before, does anybody not know what the views module is? Great, okay, so this analogy goes out to you. Let's talk about shoes. <laughs> so the views module, assuming we've got a website about shoes, is the module that lets you take a bunch of content on your website and make selections on it, first of all, and then present that content in a specific way. So it does two things. It takes the content on your website and it selects bits of the content, subsets of the content, views of the content, and it displays them in specific ways. So let's look at how it might select these shoes. It might, for example, select all of the black shoes. And you've got a module that lets you write uh, very easily set up the website so that it says, give me all the black shoes. Or you might want all of the pink shoes. Give me all the pink shoes. Or maybe you want wooden shoes, right? Depends on what the business purpose of your site is. You might want uh, shoes that have something to do with animals. You might even want shoes that could be lethal. So you tell your website what you want, and it gives it to you using views. And then, after it's made the selection, you've got dozens of opportunities on how to present the content that you've just selected. So views can give you content listings, so that be, can be a, you know, a river of news type uh, wall type of listing. It can be an RSS or atom feed. Views would know how to you know, give you an atom feed for pink shoes. Okay? Or you can make slideshows, rotating banners, you can make tables with sortable columns where you can you know, get very clear in overviews. Uh, we use that in Drupal Commerce a lot where you see your orders and how many inventory you've got and how much revenue you've got, so very number oriented. Uh, you can build views that are search results, so views can take what are called uh, arguments and filters. So maybe um, I put the search term Hello Kitty into a box and my view shows me all the shoes that um, match Hello Kitty and it displays them as search results. This is all done by views. And views is also responsible for the API endpoints for uh, web services that I was talking to you about earlier. So if you need to make a mobile app that needs to display the shoes on your phone, you make a view that finds the shoes that you need with the right parameters, and then you send that data off as a, a REST API simply by telling the view to emit JSON instead of a table or a slideshow. In fact, the same view can emit all of those different displays uh, depending on what you need. So the same selected content can be displayed as many ways as you need it, and that is really the fundamental reason why uh, Drupal has been so popular in the last years, is because you could define any type of content with fields and entities, and then you could select it and display it using views. Those, that's the magic of Drupal right there. And that's all in core. That's all in Drupal 8 the day you download it. So that's really, really good news. The next business value of Drupal 8 is actually a pain point that is becoming less painful. And it's not a Drupal-specific pain point. It's just that uh, the more industrialized your website is, the more professional your development process is, the more you run into this particular pain point. This particular pain point is the process of taking a bunch of people developing your site, a bunch of people testing your site, a bunch of people working on content in a staging area of your site, and moving that all into the production version of the site. If you look at this, it's literally, in this case, six different copies of the website on different machines with different physical copies of the data and different people working on it that have to flow in a workflow towards the production site. And managing that flow for anything that can't be pushed in the actual code of the website into the PHP code has been really problematic. Now, modern development practices say that everything that flows in this pipeline is going to be in a revision control system, usually Git these days. And Git is by far the most popular uh, tool for doing this, but it doesn't matter. Uh, any revision control system will have the same problem. The problem is that you need to be able to check your changes into your revision control system into Git and push them into the next uh, version of the website in this workflow. And if you 
if there's part of the change that you're making that can't be expressed in code, in text files on the file system and put into a revision control system, then you can't follow this workflow. Now, what would that mean? Okay, so maybe one of the things that I'm changing in this workflow is we're going to come up with a new line of shoes, all right? Maybe we're gonna have boots for winter, all right? And maybe I have a new search functionality or a new slideshow functionality for those boots for that campaign that my marketing team thought up. And if you think about the problem, not only do I need the new slideshow, which is a bit of code and a view and a display, I also need the information about the boots. That's data. So moving the code and the data about the website through these stages of development has historically been a big problem for Drupal and for other websites and other technologies. And Drupal solves this very, very elegantly with something called the Configuration Management Initiative, where all of the data that you would need about your boots and your slideshow can be exported together in an easy to read YAML file that is very friendly for Git revision control and put into Git at one phase, on your development phase, and then imported by the next phase. So you export it in dev, you import it in test. And when you've tested it and maybe changed it, you export it in test and move it into stage. And it goes along the workflow and the configuration uh, and staging of variables and other changes that you're making to your website can now be staged using the best practice tools that you apply to your code development. And that's great. That's a huge headache that people hated about Drupal 7 solved. There will still be other challenges, but it's such a dramatic step forward that developers who have faced this will be all smiles in comparison. The next business value about Drupal, even if you've never heard of these things before, you'll really like that they're there, is that everything in Drupal is now basically entities and fields. Entities and fields are generally really good things in Drupal because entities and fields, you can define them yourself, means you can model any type of business case that you have, and they instantly play nice with all of Drupal's great features that I've just shown you. Okay, entities basically have fields. So if I wanted to create a, um, I don't know what's a great example, a party entity because I want to have a party, then I would have fields that were the people I want to invite, fields that show the location of the party, fields that have the time of the party, fields that show uh, what the theme of the party is going to be, comments for people that want to talk about the party, uh, ratings for people who want to rate my party after they've been there, um, image fields for people who want to upload their photos to the party. So I've got an entity party and fields that I put on top of that. I can make any data model on Earth that I want with the system, and everything in Drupal is now entities and fields. It used to be that things like comments or blocks, if you're familiar with Drupal 7, were not entities and were not fields and that made them painful exceptions to people who were trying to build things with Drupal and you had to learn extra techniques for managing things like comments and blocks in Drupal 7. Now in Drupal 8, they're unified, standardized, and they all seamlessly fit in with all of the other tools that you want. So comments are fields, that means I can take uh, a comment field and I couldn't put it on any, um, I can add, they're fieldable, I can put new fields on my comments, so maybe I don't want just a title and a body, but I want a rating as well, or maybe an image, I can put that there. And I can add my comment to any type. It used to be in Drupal 7 that you could only comment on nodes. If you've been in the Drupal world long enough, you've definitely heard the N-word, the big N-word, the elephant in the room, node. What's a node? For a decade, we've tried to not say no to people. We've tried to call it pages or articles or content. But in the end, we just come back to the same word. It's a node. So in Drupal 7, you could only put comments on nodes. In Drupal 8, you can put a comment on anything. You want to have a party entity? You can put comments on your party entity. You want to put a comment on your block? You can put comments on your block. You want to put comments on your user profile? You can put comments on your user profile. They're all entities and they're all fields and it all goes on into the views and the entity cache and everything else. And there are other new fields. There's an email field, a link field, like an entity reference, or no, uh, like a web link, a phone field, uh, a date field, and they're all in core. 
they all follow semantic markup. They all fit into views and everything seamlessly. These are all things in Drupal 7 that you used to have to download uh, extra modules, use those extra modules to get that functionality. And of course, they all fit into the responsive web design of Drupal 8 so that these fields too, so here's the date field, here's a phone field, here's an email field, they can all be entered on your, uh, on your mobile device with native controls such as the number picker or the date picker um, for your various underlying devices. That would have taken an enormous amount of work in Drupal 7. It's out of the box on Drupal 8. All right. That's a lot so far, but there are a couple more. <laughs> Wait, there's more. So Drupal has long been one of the champions of search engine optimization. It's long been one of the best tools to pick if you want to have high search engine ranking based on the content that you're writing. And it just got a lot better because it incorporates actual semantic uh, schema information from schema.org, and in fact, other schemas can be incorporated to describe the content and the material that your website's actually displaying. And the best to get right on with an example, if you search in Google for restaurants in Stockholm, you get a nice listing of restaurants in Stockholm with ratings, pictures, menus, opening hours, price ranges. It tells you right there on the page, closed now or open now. Imagine how useful that is to somebody who's looking for a restaurant. Okay, you don't even need a Yelp or a TripAdvisor. You just put restaurants in Stockholm and Google. How does Google know that? Do they call all these restaurants and ask them every month, what do you have on the menu? Are you open now? Mm -mm. Semantic data from schema.org does this for Google and for these restaurants. If the restaurant puts their opening hours on their website with the right markup, with the right schema, then Google can crawl that and put this type of information right on the web. In fact, it doesn't just go for restaurants, it goes for articles, uh, TV episodes, ratings, book reviews, movies, software, events, products, and many, many more. And there's a central repository of the schemas that describe these types of entities and how you're supposed to mark them up using either RDFA or JSON or microdata. Drupal does all of that out of the box without you having to think very hard about it, and it gives you the extensible, flexible tools that you need to make your own metadata or your own schemas and publish your content using those as well. And that's really, really fantastic. That means Drupal will continue for the time being to be one of the champions in SEO. So if you're really worried about your search engine ranking, and you should be because Dr Google is still the worldwide driver of web traffic, whether we like that or not, then Drupal is a great choice for you, Drupal 8. Now, this is not a feature of Drupal itself, but this is a governance feature of the Drupal project. So I am personally deeply disappointed that we had to wait until 2015 to get Drupal 8. I wanted it two years ago. I think it's really late. I thought that was an existential risk to the existence of the project and this, the health of the project that it took this long. Fortunately, we've released it, so yeah, good for us. Are we gonna have that problem again? Are we gonna wait seven years for Drupal 9? That's what everybody should be asking. Am I going to adopt a technology that's exciting for two years and then boring for five years? All right, that's where this semantic versioning comes in. We've decided as a project to do releases and to do our versioning different with the goal of releasing more often, getting more features out the door earlier in the release cycle on an ongoing basis, and it's called semantic versioning. So it means faster innovation cycles, it means new features are going to be allowed in between the big releases. So for Drupal 7, there was an absolute feature freeze. No new features were put into Drupal 7 for the last five years. That's a long time to wait when the world changes so fast like it does these days. Won't have that problem with Drupal 8. Drupal 8 will get new features as, as soon as they make the next release because they've now figured out an organized way to do the release cycle and the versioning and to work out all of the possible problems involved with compatibility, etc. So that the minor versions, which will now come out on a planned schedule, you can mark it on your calendar and you're going to know when the next minor version 
version releases, will have all of the new features that satisfy the criteria for being released. And that means that as soon as we get a feature ready in the Drupal project, it can actually be included in Drupal 8. And you'll get that feature when you upgrade. So that's really good. And so the plan that people have for that looks something like this. So you can see the Drupal 7 timeline is big, long, monolithic blocks across the top, whereas the Drupal 8 timeline has a plan for lots of more frequent feature releases, while the Drupal 9 development plan will uh, kick off uh, somewhere along the line. And we will not release a Drupal 9 until it's so significantly different and the changes are so important that it can no longer be compatible with Drupal 8. So it might be that Drupal 8's with us for a very long time, which is fine because it can still get new features all the time. Now, just one more quick video before I move to questions. Battery? Oh, that, that microphone. Hello? <laughs> is, okay. If, uh, so this is a deeply different way of doing things than we had before. And uh, the goal in the core team is to maintain backwards compatibility across all of the major, like 8.12 and so on. And there's a really interesting plan to make the move to 9 simply another small incremental move instead of a giant rebuild move. So this, is, this could really, really change um, and put us in the league of a project like Typo 3 that has extremely easy major um, version updates nowadays and, and we never have. The other point, um, Dries, talks about, Dries talks about this specific, the sem semantic versioning as a tool for uh, preventing burnout and for having developer retention because if you think of something smart, you can have it released in core in six months or a year or 18 months rather than six years from when you think about it. You don't so have to wait five years to see your feature implemented. Exactly. Thank you. Good. So in closing, I just want to give you a look at this. This is for starting in around 2012. Um, the uh, commit history of developers actually changing files on Drupal 8 leading up to its release. I've uh, accelerated it quite dramatically so that it fits in the time. Every one of those points on the snowflake is a file and every like blip that you see is a person changing that file. A lot of work went into Drupal 8. Jam, what was the number? 3,000? Uh, core developer? Core, develop core commits was uh, like well over 2,000. Uh, uh, core developers was 3,200. Right. That means 3,200 individuals have their name on code that went into Drupal 8. That's a heck of a lot of people. That was an enormous effort to coordinate. And that video uh, kind of sums it up in a, in a very brief snowflake flash. Um, to visualize that number of people, you only have to um, <laughs> um, you only have to look at a picture like this uh, and think that that would be about in that picture maybe a third to half of the people who actually contributed to Drupal 8. So when we say our development community is really big, we mean it, and that's something to be quite proud of. So all of those people times two had to work together over five years to bring you the Drupal 8 that you have available today. And when I put this all together, even though I'd been observing and been part of some of the discussions and know a lot of the people who have contributed to Drupal, uh, the true excitement for Drupal 8 didn't hit me until I put this presentation together and I got quite excited thinking about it. So with that, I turn it over to you to ask any questions that you might have thought of or have now while I was giving my presentation. Who wants to go first? Yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, Drupal 8 kind of uh, helps uh, in managing your photos. Does that also mean that you have like the responsive images in terms of uh, size, like small yes. size? In so fact, I'm, I think, I can't remember if my video actually showed that, but the video that it was taken from actually was showing how to do responsive images. R what are responsive images? A responsive image is an image that can take up 1,024 pixels of width on a big monitor, but progressively shrinks to take up the right amount of space on your screen as you shrink the viewport, so that if I look at the image on my iPhone, I get a smaller version of the image that takes up less bandwidth, that fits perfectly into the design, just because I've looked at it on my iPhone. And it's part of the 
hashing scheme. Uh, the 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 image only gets generated when it gets called the first time, and then it gets saved and cached, and it, it never has to be calculated again. Um, and this saves you a ton of battery power on your phone if you're served the right size image, and your browser mobile browser doesn't have to reprocess it. Right. Great. Next question. Yes, sir. How hard will it be to upgrade from 7 to 8? Great point. I should have had that in my presentation. So historically, the Drupal upgrade process was disastrous. Like the advice of seasoned professionals was just build a new website. It's going to be easier. <laughs> Um, fortunately, a tool was developed along the way called the Migrate module, which then became the preferred way of doing any migration from a non-Drupal site into a Drupal site. Um, if I had a WordPress site and I wanted to move it to Drupal, I'd use the Migrate module. The Migrate module basically lets you say data in the old version is going to map to this type of data in the new version and then progressively run batches of migrations on that until it's all migrated and you can roll it back and you can start over and you can throw some data away. You can do it over time and, and, and you know can test it and then throw it away. It's, it's really good. They decided that wouldn't it be nice if that was just the way Drupal was upgraded in general. So instead of having to have a Drupal 7 site and hope that all the upgrades work, uh, there are now migration paths using the migrate module from Drupal 7 and Drupal 6 into Drupal 8. And you can study those and use those to migrate from any technology into Drupal 8. And it's all a unified experience. So while it, there's still going to be an exercise in deciding what did my old site do and what do I want my new site to do and let me get the data and the functionality in there in the right way, it's going to be a lot easier. So for any complicated site, any Drupal 7 site or otherwise, there's still going to be the decision, what's the old set of features? What's the new set of features? How do I move the data from the old feature set into the new feature set so that it lines up right? What type of manipulation might I have? But for a really simple Drupal 7 site, it should actually just upgrade on its own. And overall, the opportunities uh, for upgrading are much better, and the cost and time should be much lower. This side of the room can also ask questions. Uh, so my next question is about hosting. Uh, so I have uh, Drupal been working with uh, Google, uh, Amazon, and other com companies to provide good hosting for Drupal 8, or how does it work? So I'm very proud to say that my company that I'm going to demonstrate in the room across the hall is currently hosting the two largest Drupal 8 sites known on Earth. That's uh, letemps.ch, so it's French-speaking Swiss newspaper, and Zutostschweiz, which is another German-speaking Swiss paper. Uh, and they're both on Drupal 8 now. And then uh, Jam's company, Acquia, and I had a slide from Pantheon, and I'm sure there are a dozen other hosting companies that have already done all of the work to make sure that Drupal 8 fits really well into their system. The um, special thing about Pantheon, Acquia, and Platform.sh is that they're platform-as-a-service companies, so they actually think about your development workflow and your product, uh, how you deploy. It's not just hosting, but it's like the whole life cycle. So there was a little bit of extra work that was needed to be done to make sure like the CMI works well uh, so that you can update things from Composer, stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it's ready on all three of those platforms and others as well. There's a question in the back there. <laughs> They've got a mic. Yeah, OK. Um, like, what, what would be the most radical change or like uh, challenging uh, stuff to do to migrate uh, Drupal 7 theme to a Drupal 8? I mean, speaking as a themer or as a developer. OK, so speaking as a themer, yeah. um, if you're given a Drupal 7 theme, then it's very likely going to have some sort of application logic built into the theme layer, which is a mistake, but it was committed very often. So it would be to identify any PHP code that might be actually doing business logic in the theme and to remove that and make that then be a custom module of some sort that provides the template code to expose that to the template layer in the right way. So there might be some refactoring like that. If 
your Drupal 7 site is written well and doesn't have that, and it's basically just emitting PHP template variables at the right time, that should be a very easy thing to do to change that into Twig because it's the difference between a print statement in PHP and the, the double curly brace variable in Twig. You might have to see if all your variables are the same, uh, if they're you like your template snippets, if your partials are the same. But um, the first time you might have a lot of learning to do, the second time it'll go faster, the third time you'll be a pro. Okay, thank you. One more question. No more questions. All right, then uh, soon, I suppose, uh, we'll start across the way. Yes. And thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Så ja, exakt. Nu är det slut för idag. Eh, som sagt, följ gärna i eh, enkäterna. Och sen så hoppas jag att ni har haft en bra och inspirerande dag och kom, fått lite nya idéer. Tankar framöver på vad ni ska göra med era Drupal-sajter. Eh, vi ses i rummet tvärs över hallen om en liten stund. Alltså, finns inte där för något en timme? Om en timme? Det är inte mingelar upp en stund först och sen kommer ni hit. Okej. Okay. Mingel där upp en stund först och sen kommer ner hit om en timme ungefär. Då får vi träffa Jam och Robert igen.